And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me once again to the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis, and chapter number one. The book of Genesis and chapter number one. We're progressing through this creation seminar, and we've hit some terms. We've gone ahead and explained what was in the beginning, brought us up to the idea of the Genesis flood, and explained those terms. And now as we progress on, we want to hit another subject. This one's a very important subject and a question that people ask. What about cavemen? And so if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis in chapter number 1. The book of Genesis chapter 1. And if you don't mind, look with me in Genesis chapter 1 and notice with me in verse number 26. The book of Genesis chapter 1 and in verse number 26, the Bible says this. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God made man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the book of Genesis chapter 1? The book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 27, notice the phrase, God created man in his own image. God created man in his own image image. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God, a God who's worthy to be worshiped and worthy to be served. And as we come to you, we're just asking that you would give us grace, that you would give us mercy, that you would help eliminate distractions, that we could put our attention upon you and that you could teach us and uh, give us understanding on a subject that we want to make sure that we have down and that we are correct in. I'm asking that you would use us to be an encouragement to folks. And again, I'm very desperate for your spirit now, Lord, that our minds and hearts would be upon you. So the best I know how, once again, I surrender myself to you. I ask that you fill me with your precious spirit and that you can get your own work accomplished tonight and encourage your people. Thank you, Lord, that we could trust you in Jesus name. Amen. In the Bible, God clearly states that he created man in his own image. And yet, <laughs> evolution teaches that one day we will become God. That evolution, by its very nature, says that we're getting better and better and better and better. And the very end of that teaching is that one day we will be God. However, the Bible teaches something completely different. The Bible teaches that we were made in God's image and that we are getting worse and worse and worse. So why do we pay to teach the kids that this is grandpa? Inside of public schools, they are taught all the time that evolution is true and that we came from monkeys. It is a common thing. Why do we pay through our taxes to allow teachers to teach this philosophy? After all, <laughs> what about cavemen? This is something that's taught quite often. What about cavemen? Did we come from caves? Did we come from men who lived in caves? Well, one of the things that we have to do is depends on what we mean by cavemen. We know in the Bible, many people lived in caves. Lot and his daughters lived in caves for a while. The five kings found hid at the cave at Mecheth in the book of Joshua. You have the children of Israel made themselves dens, which were in the mountains and caves and strongholds. So we know that men did live in caves using it as an abode, but we understand that's not quite what people mean by cavemen. We know that someone indeed is trying to make a monkey out of us. They're trying to say that we came from monkeys ourselves. So let's explore some. Let's start with Nebraska man. Nebraska man is a very interesting <coughs> um, find. Nebraska man was found by one tooth, one single tooth. And from this and a lot of imagination, they built Nebraska man, a wife, or a, a whole skeleton just from that one tooth. 
supposing how he looked, and then built him a wife as well. We know that in the side of archaeology, paleontology, that according to them, one bone is enough to disrupt the whole system as they're constantly looking for fossils, missing links, cavemen, that they're, all they're doing is trying to find some evidence, even if it's one tooth that could disrupt the whole thing and show that cavemen might actually exist. So Nebraska man was found, some guy found a tooth, identified it, said this is obviously from an uh, uh, ancestor of human, from the imagination, built him, a, uh, built him a whole skeleton, built him a wife. This is on display. <clears throat> it was built as an illustration. And after they did some more studies, they found out where this tooth actually came from. Let me show you Nebraska man. <laughs> so from a tooth that they found that was actually from an ancient pig, they said it was a caveman, built himself a wife, built himself... Um, <laughs> Um, a skeleton, built himself a lineage and a family, and then at some time had told the boys and girls that this was one of our ancestors, all from a tooth that was misidentified. Well, let's try a different guy. Let's try Piltdown Man. Piltdown Man, when it came out in 1912, all the newspapers heralded it as proving that Darwin was true. Is it true that this find of Piltdown Man, that it was discovered and put as great evidence to show evolution was true? In fact, it was even tried to be used as evidence in the Scopes Monkey Trial. If you're not familiar with the Scopes Monkey Trial, it happened in Dayton, Tennessee, that there was a law in Tennessee that said that school teachers could not teach evolution. Well, the ACLU helped back a teacher to try to give him some courage to go ahead and dare to teach evolution inside of the um, classroom. Well, <laughs> he was he was uh, charged for teaching evolution. And what they did is they threw a big circus together to celebrate the trial. They actually brought a carnival. They brought animals. They brought whatnot. It became a national zoo for this court trial. And part of the court trial, what they tried to do was admit into evidence the so-called evolution of man. Now, the judge threw it out, said, listen, the only thing on trial is, did he teach evolution? We're not trying to prove whether evolution existed or not. And so uh, it was on its own merits. However, it was this Piltdown Man, which was often called Dawn Man, had been submitted to be presented as evidence inside of an official court trial. Well, it found out that this was a hoax. That what the guy did is he found a, or put a jawbone together, filed it down, made it look old, and put it with an ape um, skull, filed it down, made it look together, threw it out in a parking lot, and then happened to find it. Well, people had studied this. I think there was 30-something people that got their doctorate degree by writing a paper on Piltdown Man and how it was going to prove evolution. Well, 30 years later, it was found to be false and that this guy was proven that he had uh, messed this whole thing up, put it as a hoax. I wonder if those people who submitted their doctrine ever turned those doctrine back in for basing their doctrine on a fraud. But yet it was going to be used as a uh, evidence inside of a court case. What about Nathan Neanderthal man? Neanderthal man is another very interesting one used very commonly as evidence inside of uh, the evolution of man. Now, the idea with Neanderthal man is they said, well, look if apes, they walk on four legs. You have man who was walking on two legs. And here is Neanderthal who's happened to be halfways in between. Now, They've already found out before this even existed that all it was was an old guy with arthritis who had been living in a cave and had very much uh, diseases and issues with him. However, when they were looking for evidence, they went and dug this guy back up and tried to, pre pre to present him as evidence, as evolution, and said, look at how his skeleton is curved. Here's a guy who's halfway up and halfway down. He's a guy who's slowly starting to stand back up. No, it's a guy who's slowly starting to get back down because of the diseases that he had. We know that there have been over 200 different Neanderthal uh, findings as people did live in caves. There was disease. All of these things all tie into the Neanderthal man. 
Now, <laughs> I have the book up here. In fact, all of the books that I'm going to reference, I have up here that you can look up for yourself. After examining the famous Rhodesian man or Broken Hill Nathanthal skull, Dr. Kukzo uh, said, you must understand that this skull really cries out disease. The teeth are badly decayed. The bones of the vault of the skull are extremely thick. There are many features that testify that this guy was diseased and not an ancestor of man, but he was a man who was diseased. Now, <laughs> one of the things that we understand is that before the flood, people lived a long time. And even after the flood, the ages of how long people lived slowly decreased. That it went from 400 years to 200 years to 100 years, which is still quite a long time. Now, something that you may not know is that the brow ridges of a skull never stop growing. And so if they never stop growing and you live to be 400 years old, how thick do you think those skull ridges might be? <laughs> this skull right here indicates that he might be over 200 years old because it never stops growing. <laughs> we know that <laughs> several professors actually lied about the ages of the Neanderthal scrolls for 30 years, and all of his work was uh, proven wrong, disregarded, and yet it is still taught in textbooks as evidence of the evolution of man. Now, just because uh, skulls look different doesn't mean that they're slowly evolving, that these are all, mod all modern skulls, and all of them are people who live today, and their skulls look different. Well, someone may say, well, look at the skull ridges of the aborigine. <laughs> look at how they've been growing. This must be show that they, they were used to be apes. Well, it's actually been shown that people who use their jaws for a lot of obsessive chewing, that what happens is that it pulls on the muscles and it causes that skull ridge to grow as well. And a lot of the skulls that they find of native tribes that uh, <laughs> third or fourth world countries, that what happens is because of their constant chewing, chewing on sticks, chewing on other things, that it actually makes it grow. It doesn't mean that they are less evolved than anyone else. It just means that they live in different environments. So let's go to a different one. We have Cro-Magnon Man. Cro-Magnon Man is modern man in every respect. There is no difference between him and so-called modern man. And yet he is taught as a missing link when there is no difference between the two. Then we have Australopithecus Africanus often known as Cro-Magnum Man. I'm um, sorry, as um, an earlier ancestor, sorry. Australopithecus Africanus has actually been shown that he coexisted with man and therefore could not have been the ancestor. If he's living the same time as man, then he can't be the ancestor. That kind of makes sense. But yet it is taught in the textbooks that he's an ancestor of man. <laughs> Let's go to another one, Astrophypicus Afri uh, afarensis, otherwise known as Lucy. Anyone who went through school probably remembered being taught about Lucy as one of the great finds of the evolution of man. Well, let's learn a little bit about Lucy. Lucy was discovered by the paleontologist Donald Johansson. Donald Johansson was given a grant and just happens two weeks before his um, grant money ran up and he was not going to receive any more money, he happened to come up with a find. It's funny how that happens. So he goes and finds this great skeleton. Now notice that they developed an entire skeleton, uh, skull from it, but notice the skull fractures that they have. It is very hard to come up with how the skull looked when that's all you have as evidence of it. But yet they came up with their own design of how Lucy should have looked. Now, He's called Lucy because they happen to be listening to the song by the Beatles, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. By the way, if you don't know what that stands for, that's where the song comes from, LSD, which is probably what they were on when they were looking for it. Anyways, <laughs> National Geographic happened to do an article talking about Lucy heralded as a man. 
uh, as one of the pre-ancestors of man. And in here, they misidentified that middle knee. That is not Lucy's knee. It is actually a Hadar knee, which was found a year earlier, 70 meters lower and over a mile away. And yet National Geographic continued to call it Lucy and claiming it was part of the skeleton. Now, why is this important? Why is that knee important? Well, Johansson said that the femur being angled, notice it's a little bit of an angle, proved that Lucy was becoming a human. Why is that? The reason is, <laughs> is that apes have straight legs, man has a angled leg, and Lucy had an angled leg. Well, we know that tree climbing monkeys have an angled femur. Femur. That doesn't mean that they're becoming more human. It is what they are designed to do in order to climb trees effectively. In addition, they also said that Lucy's knee was slightly bigger than a regular ape's. The idea was is that because it was slightly bigger than a regular ape's, it is proving that it is slowly becoming human. Well, just because something is bigger doesn't mean it's changing. We know that the bones of a Clydesdale are slightly bigger than a regular horse. Does that mean that a Clydesdale is turning into a Mack truck? <laughs> just because it's bigger doesn't mean that it's changing into something. We know that today there are big horses and there are little horses. It doesn't mean that the little horses evolved into the big horses. It just means that we have different sets of horses. Well, the St. Louis Zoo has taken Lucy, and what they did, remember that skeleton, there was no hands or feet discovered, and yet the St. Louis Zoo has made hands and feet for them. We know that the, the display is not for education, but it's for indoctrination. What do you mean by that? Well, <laughs> professors have actually examined it and said, we know that this is a dis misrepresentation. This is not what Lucy's... Uh, uh, feet would look like. They purposely changed it to make it look like human feet rather than monkey feet. And even though they knew that it was correct, the St. Louis officials refused to change the display because, as they said, we look at the overall exhibit and the impression it creates. We think the overall impression that this exhibits creates is correct, meaning that they purposely want people to believe that monkeys turn into man, and they have a display here to show all the boys and girls that we came from monkeys. It is done on purpose. Here is a famous uh, line of <coughs> the Lintido, uh footprints that was discovered. This is something they use as evidence to show that humanoids were walking upright about 3.75 million years ago. Now, the interesting thing is that people have actually studied these footprints, and they saw that the form of this foot was exactly like ours. So the footprints that they studied of this early humanoid uh, trail looks just like our feet. Now, this is going to pay... Uh, play into what we were talking about. Remember the St. Louis Zoo made it look like human feet? Here they said, here's an ancient trail that looked like human feet. So <laughs> they said that these footprints look just like ours. Russell Tuttle of the University of Chicago was the foremost expert in studying footprints. He went and studied barefoot people of people who lived around the world and studied them and found that none of their features suggest that these humanoids were less capable bipeds than us, meaning that just studying the footprints and studying the footprints of all the people around the world, they look just like ours. Okay, great, wonderful. He also said that if the footprints were not known to be so old, I would readily concede that they were made by someone of ours. He'd be human. But the, I know they can't be human because they're so old. Well, what's happening is that he's trying to prove his theory rather than see what the evidence has to say. Now, the idea of feet is a very big deal. And they have show humanoid feet. However, we know monkeys have quite a different foot than us. Here is the a drawing, an artist redemption of those footprints, but notice something different if you could see it. Notice that there is a split in the toes that was not found in the original um, 
a footprint line. This artist drew a separation on purpose because they have to show a little bit of a transition of monkeys turning into man. Why? Because we know that human feet and apes' feet look completely different. That apes' feet have, or monkeys' feet have, <laughs> have, um, feet made for grasping for their hanging and upside down. You guys can't hang upside down on branches, can you? Some of you might try, but you can't do it with your feet. But yet monkeys are able to do such things. Their feet is designed completely different than ours, which poses a problem because they have to somehow show how the feet slowly change. That's what that artist was attempting to do. But that's not what evidence says, that all of the so-called evolution of man, they all have humanoid feet. They're always drawn with humanoid feet, even though monkeys' feet look completely different than human feet. The various astropithecus are indeed more different than both African apes and humans in most features than the latter are from each other. This is people who have studied arthropithecus. They said, hey, they can't be in the evolution of man because they're more different than apes than they are from us. They can't fit. There are too many changes. In fact, another shot to the theory is that they found Australopithecus lucy still alive today. Well, they can't be part of our evolution if they're still alive. Let's go to another guy. Here is Peking Man. Peking Man was found from pieces of a skull in 1920s in Peking, China. Now, what had happened is that they went and they found all these monkey skulls all bashed in next to human tools. Their conclusion is, look, these monkeys are slowly becoming smart. They got human tools that are surrounding, uh, putting around them. Could there be another explanation? We know that there are many cultures that actually eat monkey brains. Could it be that this was leftover dinner and that they had left their tools behind? Could that also be backed up that they actually found human skulls that were found with these monkey bones, but they had uh, never told that there were 10 humans found with these monkeys? I guess maybe it was their tools, not the monkey's tools, huh? So they cannot be the missing link. It does not help that all evidence of Peking Man happened to disappear conveniently during World War II. There's no evidence of it today. Oops, let's uh, hide this so no one could go investigate it, especially since others had already been proven to be false. Then we have Homo erectus. This is another interesting study. Homo erectus has been taught in modern day textbooks as uh, Java man, Homo erectus. Java man, <laughs> previously called Pinthocrimpus erectus, meaning erect ape man, now called Homo erectus, was dated by evolutionists to be a half a million uh, years old, was only made from a few scraps of bone found in 1891 in Java, Indonesia. You have the Dutch atomi uh, <laughs> autonomous Dubois, who believed in evolution, and he went to Java, Indonesia, to look for missing links. Now, the one thing they don't tell people in the article is that Dubois had no training whatsoever in paleontology or geology. And his archaeological team involved a bunch of convicts that he had put together and their prison guards. Uh, that's a good archaeological team. Also, when Java Man was found, Dubois was not there. The prisoners had found it. That makes it quite interesting. Dubois actually made his own fraud, that he took an ape skull cap, three human teeth and a thigh bone from a human, and he scattered them out, and then they found him when he was gone, and they said, oh, look, we found a missing link. Of course, he was found out that it was a fraud, but yet he is still taught in textbooks today as one of the evolution of man. And as I said before, he also was going to be used as evidence in the Scopes Monkey Trial as evidence of the evolution of man being presented inside of a court of law that evolution was true. Interesting. A Verco, who had been once Heckel's professor and regarded as the father of modern pathology, said, in my opinion, this creature was an animal, a giant gibbon, and the thigh bone doesn't have anything to do with the skull bone whatsoever. So people have examined it, proved that it was false, and they had found out that Dubois had staged the whole thing. Dubois, as he had uh, 
found it, he had also hid the fact that he took two normal human skulls that were found in the same area. He actually hid them in the floorboards of his uh, bedroom so no one can find it. So <laughs> they couldn't be exposed. The humans were found at the same time. Interesting. Now, you're starting to build up a case that all this evolution of man, when you backtrack it, actually looks suspect at best, if not outright fraud after fraud after fraud. You could see more of this in these books, Bone of Contention, and some of the other books that I have here, where it goes in a lot more detail about each one of these. Very interesting, isn't it? Now, People who've studied this admit that there are not enough fossil records to answer when, where, and how Homo sapiens emerged. In addition, they can't even say that where chimpanzee, uh, chimpanzee evolution took back. They said there's no evidence that chimpanzees ever evolved. We're so worried about trying to find how we got from chimps to humans that you can't find anything where chimps came from. There's no missing links from there either. There was big gaps leading from here to here to here to finally humans. They can't find any evidence for it. But yet you have magazines like this asking all the time, where are we going as we're evolving and we're becoming better and better? Where are we headed? Well, we have a Bible answer for them that if they don't accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior, they're headed to an awful place called hell. We are not getting better and better and better. We are getting worse and worse and worse. So... We know that all the time that people are finding so-called evidence for man and trying to put on symposiums. Here's a skull found in Spain, promoted as the oldest example of man in Eurasia, later on found out that it was a donkey. <laughs> the three-day symposium to discuss the so-called horse man named for the town in southern Spain was canceled. Well, yeah, probably. Here's another one as an example. A dolphin's rib had been labeled a human collarbone and promoted as evidence for evolution. An actual evolutionist disproved it and said, this isn't right, let's not put this out. Interesting, isn't it? Now, all of these so-called cavemen are dealt in great detail in this book, The Bones of Detention. If you're interested, this is a book that I would recommend for you to study it in more detail. All I'm doing is giving you the small capsule thing. There is a lot more study and detail that goes along with it to show that this isn't just some guy trying to give a presentation. There is research done on each one of them to show where the so-called uh, evidences of the evolution of man came to. Which leads us to modern man, who's also in this chain of events. We know that the textbooks today still teach these things. All the ones circled in red are all um, so-called evolution of man that has been proven that cannot be fit inside of the evolution of man, and yet still taught in textbooks that they are. After many, many years of it being disproven, they're still taught in modern textbooks. Even in colleges are still teaching that these things are true in modern colleges. They also like to promote that there's homo sapiens and that one day we're going to become homo sapien sapiens. Now the word sapien means wise. So they said that one day we're going to be the wise of the wise, that you give us enough time and you let us evolve, that we're going to evolve into something special, homo superior, homo sapien sapien. We're going to be the wise of the wise. Well, the Bible has something to say about this too. It says in Romans 1, professing themselves to become wise, they become fools that with all of their evidence, all they're doing is proving that they're very foolish to try to go against the Bible and what the Bible has to say. Now we have articles like this that appear every few uh, weeks in a paper. In order for propaganda to work, it has to be repeated. Here's one that says he's the daddy of them all. Now, the one thing we know, we don't know he's a daddy of anybody. All we know is that he died. We don't know if he had any kids. Here's another one, the mother of all mammals. We don't know if it had any kids at all. We don't know that this is the uh, mother of all of the other mammals. But yet you have articles like this all the time. Now, if you find a fossil in the dirt, there's only a couple things you could tell. First of all, 
All you know is that it died. That's it. You have evidence that something died. You don't know if it had any kids. You don't know that it produced any different kids. So did this cat produce a dog? Did this fish produce corn? I mean, did it produce something that it's not? So why do evolutionists claim that bones in the dirt can do something that living animals cannot do? That is, produce different kinds other than themselves. Cats only produce cats. Dogs only produce dogs. Fish produce fish. No fossil would ever count as evidence in a court of law. Now, a similar design demonstrates a common designer. It doesn't mean that they turned into something that they previously were something different. So where does the Stone Age fit with to the Bible? We want to be able to have a biblically defensible position, so let's answer the question. Where does the Stone Age fit in this? Well, we know that there was a worldwide flood that devastated everything. And after the worldwide flood came, everything completely changed. So what about our facts ad? Going up and saying, Dad, where are all the people at? I mean, we don't have any neighbors. Where'd everybody go? Well, there was a great flood. Let me tell you about it. Well, after the flood, people couldn't go to a hardware store. They couldn't go buy a hammer or a shovel. They had to use the tools that they had on hand. There was no hardware store. The same is true. If you were shipwrecked on a deserted island, you would have to survive on what you had available to make things work. So the Stone Age was after the flood when they got off the ark and faced a devastated world and some bad people were banished and driven out from society and they had to survive with what they had as they carried things with them. We know that even today many cultures still make and use stone tools. Does that mean that they're less evolved? No, they don't want to travel with all of their tools, but they do a lot of traveling. They just use what is on hand during that time. And if it happened to be a sharp rock, that's great. If they could sharpen the rock, even better. But you don't want to travel with your tools because they are heavy. And you also don't have the time to go dig in the earth, go smite, uh, go dig up some iron ore, smite it, melt it down, and then arrange it with a stick and put it together however it needs to be. <laughs> you don't have the time to do that. So with this, not only were people living longer before the flood, but so were animals. You know, animals were bigger back then. Here was a rhinoceros that was 18 feet tall. That'd be a pretty big rhino, wouldn't it? How would you like to run into that guy? Someone said, how do you keep a rhino from charging? You take away its credit card. All right, anyways. Now, because of the canopy that surrounded the earth, it would cause the double air pressure, which would also cause insects to grow larger. Insects don't breathe through their lungs, they breathe through their skin. So with double oxygen, double air pressure, they can even grow to be a lot bigger. We know that today bugs are limited in size by the oxygen and air pressure, but you double the oxygen, double the air pressure, they can get a lot bigger. Bugs in oxygen rich waters can grow up to be a thousand times heavier than those living off of Europe. So they got bigger. That's just a little chart explaining all the things. Here's a dragonfly, a fossilized dragonfly that had a 50-inch wingspan. Can you imagine running into that with your car windshield? Maybe sitting in the driver's seat with you saying, hi, what's up? I mean, can you imagine how big those things were to see those things flying right at you? How about this? We know that today cockroaches can get big. They can get big as they are. But we have fossilized cockroaches that can get to be 18 inches. That's quite a bit. Could you imagine them crawling around in your house? You wouldn't call the exterminator, you'd call the National Guard. How about centipedes? Centipedes getting to be eight feet long. How would you like that thing to be crawling around with you in your basement or from your water spout? I mean, that's a big thing. How about this? Fossils of grasshoppers over two feet long have been found. That'd be a lot of meat on that thing, wouldn't it? What about this? Fossilized tarantula. 
How would you like to meet that big old thing in a dark alley? Crawling over on top of your roof. My daughter says if she ever wrecks the car, it's because she found a spider in there. You imagine that thing in the back of your truck. He'd be driving it for you. We have fossilized cattails, 60 feet long. That's pretty big cattails. How about this? There was a donkey excavated near Lubbock, Texas, because everything grows bigger in Texas. That was nine feet high at the shoulder. That's a big donkey. You couldn't make that thing move if you wanted to. Giant sloths were on the earth before the flood. Big old huge beast. You had a um, giant elk with a 12-foot antlers. For those hunters, that's a big rack. Would you like to have that thing hanging up? There were things bigger back then. They had giant kangaroos the size of a Mini Cooper. How would you like to run into that thing? They had birds that could get 13 feet tall. That's a big bird, wouldn't it? In fact, they have found uh, the eggs of some of these birds. Next to it is an ostrich egg, which is the biggest egg that we have currently. Notice how small it is compared to that other bird egg. Would you like to see what popped out of that thing to chase you? They had a prehistoric goose that was as tall as an elephant and weighed one ton. That's a big goose. Fossilized beavers over eight feet long have been found. That's a pretty big beaver. Here's one found here in Wisconsin of a jaw of eight of a seven to eight foot long beaver here in Wisconsin. Uh, they would just grow up to be huge. How would you like to run in that thing? Well, it makes sense. The trees grew bigger, so you need something bigger to chop down those trees, didn't you? Salamanders today grow to a bee about 15 to 20 centimeters. And yet in the fossil record, we find salamanders to be six feet long. That's a big thing. Some of you don't want to live in those times, do you? Now with that canopy of water overhead, it would increase the air pressure to allow the fish to grow bigger. Here, to, this is a modern day of a big catfish. How would you like to put, cook that thing up? Have a good catfish fry. Now that's a size that we have today. Could you imagine what they could find back in the fossil record back in those days? Sharks were 80 feet long. Some of you might remember the old movie Jaws. That was a 25 foot long one. You'd use that one as bait to catch this thing. That's a big, big mouth. Big, big teeth. We know that the pre-flood had a much stronger uh, magnetic field. Dr. Carl Ball uh, is raising piranha in an aquarium that has a magnetic field, double oxygen, double uh, air pressure inside of it. And they're growing up to be pretty huge. How would you like to run into that piranha? We know that lizards itself also uh, never stop growing. So let's take a lizard here, just a regular sized lizard, and put him in double oxygen, double air pressure, and let them live a thousand years. How big could that thing actually get? We know that uh, <laughs> dinosaurs, uh, the biggest flying dinosaur is a pterodon. Like all reptiles, it grows throughout all of its life. So just imagine a big beast iguana. Give it a thousand years. How big could that thing be? What about something like this? Nice and cute little chameleon creature. What if you allowed that thing to grow up to be a couple tons? Could you get something like that? That we know that all dinosaurs are, are very large reptiles who lived a long time, who didn't have any enemies that um, could just survive in that world. The word dinosaur itself just means terrible lizard. And like all lizards, they never stop growing. So you let them live a couple hundred years, they're going to grow up to be very, very big. Now, something interesting as we bring it back to cavemen, did you know that dinosaur footprints side by, are found side by side with humans? 
Finding them would counter evidence that humans evolved long after dinosaurs became extinct and that it would show that this would destroy the theory of evolution. If we could ever find that humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time. Well, in order for evolution to have enough time to work, there has to be a 46 million year gap between dinosaurs and man. If it doesn't have that gap, then evolution cannot work. So if dinosaurs and man could be proven to exist together, evolution would be proven to be false. Well, 45 minutes outside of Dallas, Texas, there's a little place called Glen Rose. And Glen Rose is very interesting that in about 1908, there was a huge flood that uh, went through the Paluxy River and tore up everything. If I remember correctly, the waters were over 30 feet taller than the flood stage. What happened is they went roaring through there and they ripped up entire layers of earth uh, as the waters went through. As the water began to dry, they discovered there were dinosaur footprints underneath that layer of that was ripped up. And they find all the, over the place these dinosaur footprints walking all around. It's now called Dinosaur Valley State Park. You can go and visit it today. And in fact, they went and took many of these clear dinosaur footprints, ripped them up, and brought them to different museums around the world so they could put them with the display. So you would have the skeleton of the dinosaur walking, and then you would have the dinosaur footprints behind them. Those are real footprints that were actually dug up from Glen Rose, Texas. Very interesting. <laughs> the largest block went to the American Museum in Chicago, if I remember correctly. And that you could see the actual display of the dinosaurs and the footprints left behind. Just huge, clear markings of these dinosaurs. So big that you could actually take a bath into them. So in 1930, Rosenberg, a uh, field explorer for the American Field Museum, reported 15 to 20 inch long, clearly defined human footprints with the same dinosaur tracks. Now this is significant because they're found in the same layer and the type of layer that they had would only be soft for a certain matter of time that the humans had to cross path with the dinosaurs fairly rapidly within weeks or months, not millions and millions of years. That they even have these human footprints overlapping the dinosaur footprints showing that they existed at the same time. We have all of this evidence there. Here's human tracks found inside of the dinosaur. So here's a guy who's actually stepping inside of a dinosaur track and left it inside of the fossil record, showing that they lived at the same time. And they dug this up and they find evidence of it and they've been digging in it for years and years and years, continually finding more and more evidence of human footprints and dinosaur footprints at the same time. All over the place they are discovering this. Now they've measured the human footprints and saw, of course, they live bigger than us. They had about a six foot, uh, uh, a six to seven foot stride. So as the person's walking, it is six to seven foot, showing that this person who was walking with the dinosaurs probably got to be about 11 foot tall. Everything was bigger back then. 11 foot tall walking in here. Again, lots of evidence of these dinosaur footprints and human footprints all together. Now, interesting enough is that Nova from PBS went to go uh, check out this dig site and interview an evolutionist there. This is a testimony of an assistant to the pastor who was there watching what happened. He said, I grew up in Glen Rose, Texas, and I went on an excavation with Dr. Carl Ball. We followed the footprints of a man which were beside dinosaur footprints. It was as if the man were walking with the dinosaur. Nova was there to film the dig. There was also an evolutionist who had been there arguing with Dr. Ball the entire time. Nova didn't film much of the tracks or dig, but they did interview the evolutionist. He told them that he had not seen anything there to disprove evolution. 
What he didn't tell the camera is that he refused to even turn around and look at the tracks they've been working on. That while the evolutionist was there, they actually dug up a brand new layer of tracks that had dinosaur tracks and human tracks. And they said, hey, hey, look, we just dug something up. He refused to look down and said, nope, I don't find anything that would disprove evolution. I don't see any evidence that dinosaurs and man lived at the same time. But look right at, nope, 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 I don't see anything. Nova watched him do this, by the way. He stood with his back to the dig in the tracks while making these statements. Nova knew this man had not looked at the tracks, but they didn't report that, nor did they give Dr. Carl Ball equal airtime to refute or to explain what they had dug up. It's almost like Nova doesn't believe in creation. And if you've ever watched that program, you'd know they very much hate the Bible. It's just interesting, isn't it? Now, there was some person that said, if you did find human footprints walking with the dinosaurs, it's just because there was a dinosaur that had human footprints. Could there be another explanation other than dinosaurs' feet looking like human feet? Probably. Again, in that Nova special, they said this, dinosaur footprints side by side with human footprints, finding them with counter evidence that humans evolved long after dinosaurs became extinct and back up the claim that all species, including man, were created at one time. Yes, we agree with that. Nova was like, yep, if we could find that, um, it would show evolution's not true, but too bad we can't find that. But look, no, no, we don't see it. Interesting, isn't it? Here is another man in a debate. He said, creationists have stated that humans and dinosaurs were contemporaries in time. Were this momentous statement true, the names of its discoverers would thunder down the corridors at time as individuals who made one of the most outstanding discoveries of the 20th century. That is, unless there's a media blackout that does, refuses to allow those people to make claims. The choice that we have for us is to accept that the Bible is true or allow people to take away our faith and our belief in God. That's where it comes down to. If we were just to listen to the textbooks and the evolutionists and NOVA and PBS, we would all have to conclude that the Bible is false and full of frauds and hoaxes and mythologies. And people do depend on those. But we have to make a choice. Do we trust the Bible? Knowing that the Bible has all kinds of evidence behind it. There's all kinds of proof. It's just not advertised or taught because people don't want to believe the Bible. But you have to make your own choice. The Bible speaks about in Titus chapter 1 verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. The choice that you have to make is do you believe the Bible? And you start from believing the Bible and you work your way out from there. Or you could start with the conclusion that evolution's true and the Bible's not true and have to be convinced from it. You have to start with one position or the other. The Bible is true or it is not. If the Bible is true, then, dear friend, what are you going to do with it? Do you believe it? Do you believe all of it? And if the Bible's true, are you willing to follow it? That's the idea that it all comes down to. If God's word is true then will you obey it? You see, that's the only reason why all of these people are fighting against creation. They do not want to believe that the Bible is true because if the Bible's true, that means they have to obey what it says. Well, I can't do anything about all of them. The only thing I can do is present you information and you make your own choice. Is the Bible true? And if it's true, are you willing to obey it? If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. And Dear Heavenly watch Father, this thank you so much again from for you the being a wonderful Baptist God. Church. A God who loves us so very much and cares for us. And we're just asking that you would give us grace and that you would give us mercy. Time to watch this message help us from now, the Lord, Riverview Baptist just to Church. Be able to if you trust made a decision word, for the Lord, we would love to hear from you. Or if there's anything else we could do to be a blessing to you, please let us know. You could write us at Riverview Baptist Church, 216 North Main Street, Seymour, Wisconsin, 54165, or email us at git 
rbcinfo at gmail.com. You could also join us online for live and past messages on our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, or our website, riverviewbc.com. You could also keep up with all the latest things going on at the Riverview Baptist Church by downloading our app. Search Riverview Baptist Church in your app store or text Riverview BC app to 77977. Thanks again for watching this message.